Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special online workshop about cinematography. I am Mr. B, adjunct professor at San Joaquin Delta College, and my guest today is a colleague and friend and cinematographer, Michael Thagason. I work at a nonprofit where I teach adults with developmental disabilities how to do film and video. Uh, we're called Futures Explored. We have a location in Sacramento, Stockton, and Livermore. I work at the one in Sacramento. Um, and then in my free time, weekends and evenings, I'm, I'm working on projects usually. Um, I've done a lot of projects with uh, Paul uh, or Mr. B, I should say. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we've done a ton of projects. Um, yeah. Great. So we've collaborated with you know, each other for years. We've made short films together. And now we're jumping into our first feature length film next year. So it's uh, really exciting and we rarely get time to talk about film theory and, and geek out. I mean, we do on occasion, but we're usually kind of stuck in production mode for the most part. So this is kind of our freedom to talk about uh, cinematography. And I wanted to spend more time on, you know, theory based terms instead of uh, just production because that's what I teach in class. I teach simple setups, I teach lighting, uh, talk about visual literacy and look at images, shots from movies and interpret their meaning. So Michael, I'm going to have you take it away from here and share your PowerPoint. There we go. Right. Intro to Cinematography Workshop. <laughs> uh, Paul, in your words, what role does the cinematographer play <laughs> on set? These are questions I was supposed to ask you actually. So well, you. you're a cinematographer, so I thought <laughs> instead of just defining the actual term, which anybody could look up, I thought from your end, from your perspective, you know, how would you define it? Yeah, um, I mean, cinematographer is essentially the person who is in control of the image in a film, right? So obviously working closely with the director, a director and a cinematographer probably have the closest relationship on set. Um, besides the director and the actor, probably. Um, and yeah, you're in charge of where the camera goes, what it's looking at, what lenses you're using, how the lighting looks, um, obviously all in collaboration with the director. Um, although there are films where the cinematographer does, is given the, the full reign, just the director says, go, you know, do whatever you want, I trust you. Um, I've had that happen before. Um, not with Paul. Paul doesn't let me do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's essentially what a, a cinematographer does. They're, they're in charge of what the camera is seeing it, it, or what the audience is seeing, in other words. Okay. So I, I, I kind of wanted to jump into, like, even though the cinematographer controls the image, mm -hmm. I remember when you started out, you were doing other jobs on set, like you're working with camera, you're setting up the lights, right? Does a cinematographer do that as well? Or what can we expect uh, a cinematographer to do when they start out? Sure, depends on what level. Um, I mean, a lot of short films that I work on don't have a huge budget. So sometimes uh, when I'm the cinematographer, I'm also the camera operator. I'm also my own camera assistant. I'm also the gaffer doing the lighting and everything. Like, so it dep depends on the project. Um, but on, on bigger, uh, projects, yeah, there's a separate person doing the lighting, although it's still the responsibility of what the lighting looks like kind of falls on me, um, as a cinematographer, like I work with the gaffer closely and usually, especially if it's a gaffer that knows what they're doing, I put a lot of trust in them. I'll just say, Hey, I'm looking for this type of feeling. Maybe have it, uh, the light coming from this end cause there's a window. So it needs to be motivated from that direction. And I'll just kind of set them free and make minor tweaks if I need to after that. Um, but yeah, so it, it depends. It depends on the on the project you're on, I guess. So the cinematographer can be like in control of the lighting department, pretty much. Are they pretty the cinematographer much is in control is in of the lighting department. It's kind of what you've been saying. Okay. All right. Uh, good stuff. Good to know. So if someone wanted to be a cinematographer, what kind of steps uh, would you recommend they take? <laughs> Well, as you said earlier, Paul, <laughs> we're about to work on our first feature film. So I'm still working on my steps. 
right? I think you've been um, doing it right, though. You start with small projects, working with friends, working work with short films. Um, you know, dabble. Sure, with, and um, and I mean, I, I I agree with you, but at the same time, I don't think it's only about working with friends. Because if you're right, if you only work with uh, your friends, then you're not you're not branching out and meeting new people, creating more networks, uh, right. more more connections that you have in whatever area you're in. Um, I mean, I've worked on a bunch of projects um, where I didn't know the person and they reached out to me because they've seen something that I've done before and asked me to do it. Um, so it's, I, I don't, I think it goes without saying, obviously, but I just wanted to say, you know, don't limit yourself to just right. your friends. Um, you know, Paul, Paul, you have to share me. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, man. No, um, I really understand. Yeah, but but I think, I mean, we could, we could obviously go over like, the hierarchy on a film set and where you start and kind of work your way up there. Um, but again, like you said earlier, that's something you could Google pretty easily. Yeah. Um, but, but I think it's class too. Sure. Sure. I, I think studying other people's work, like watching a film, I say this to my students all the time, watch a film and don't just watch it passively, right. Where you're just watching it to enjoy the movie for the sake of enjoyment. Um, watch it actively. Like, Pay attention to what's going on uh, in all aspects, but if, specifically if you're into cinematography, um, can look at the shots, compare other movies, uh, different cinematographers, or even the same cin cinematographer in, di in different movies that they've done throughout their career. Um, uh, oftentimes, and I think I, uh, Paul, you've done this before too. Um, I think what one of the best things to study is to watch a film, put it on mute, and I, I always put some kind of music in the background, otherwise I'm going to fall asleep. Um, but watching a movie and really kind of breaking down the cinematography, if you put, if you turn the sound off, it really helps you kind of focus, focus on, focus on the technical aspect of the filmmaking and you don't get distracted by dialogue and story and sound effects and stuff like that. Um, but so studying, uh, networking, um, and being open, like even if, and this goes for any role on set really, um, if if you have a specific, if I have a specific idea for a shot and a director says, hey, I wanna try this and it doesn't go in line with what I was thinking, I'm not gonna say no, like I'll, I'll entertain the idea, I'll even try it out. And then if it doesn't work out, I might suggest my thing again um, or throw a little of my own twist in there. Um, it's, 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 it's better to do that than to just say like, no, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. Cause then it creates a conflict on set and things get uncomfortable especially if, you, if you're new to working with that person on set. Um, so I think be, be a yes man or woman, I think is okay. <laughs> an important thing also. No, uh, so I'm gonna probably rush you a little bit here so we can get moving. Um, sure. but last, oh, last my, question. my answers are too long, I see. Okay. Uh, no, they're good, no, they're, they're good. Uh, last question I have here is, is why do you wanna make movies? Like what's the whole purpose of just oh, man. donning the role of cinematographer? If we, I mean, if we wanna get super deep here, um, we could, you know, link it back to uh, my issues of wanting to impress my father. <laughs> and uh, which I think there is some truth to that. Let's get, let's get emotional. Uh, yeah. put, put on some music here. Um, I'll light some candles. Um, no, but I, honestly, I think, I think part of it is as, as a kid, like my dad was into sports, I wasn't. And so, and like the one thing we had was like watching movies, more specifically Westerns. And he always, like, if he hadn't seen a movie, he'd always be like, oh, I bet this is going to happen at the end. And he, he was always right. And so I wonder if the reason I want to make movies is to like, you know, in a rebellious, stupid, childish way, like prove him wrong, right? Like, oh, he's not going to guess what's coming. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's what kind of, it seems weird to bring that up. But I think that's kind of what started it for me, uh, is spending time with my dad or with my family. Um, and then that turned into an obsession. It was always something that I wanted to do, but for the longest time I kind of thought it wasn't realistic. And then one day I just kind of jumped off the, the high dive and tried it out. Cool, that's an interesting story. I know a little bit about that, but I like how you kind of went in depth and uh, went into my personal. <laughs> went into my daddy issues. <laughs> All right, so uh, are we ready to move on? Take a look at sure. some shots in movies.
And this is kind of the definition that I wanted to go over just in case those out there wanted to understand what, further understand what we were talking about. So visual literacy, I, I threw up the definition here. It's just making sense of the images we see on screen. And I think a lot of my students who come into the program, they're interested in being, you know, cinematographer, of course, and they just like images because they look beautiful, but they don't understand the meaning behind it. And that's where they get to learn, you know, a lot in RTV 21. And we kind of do this in the second day of class, but I think because you're here, we're going to kind of go more in depth and throw in our own opinions about the shots. Uh, so this is like the most important aspect of cinematography is understanding what you're looking at and, and, you know, really understanding more about the craft yourself by watching others, kind of like what you brought up earlier. So let's take a look at some of these shots. Yeah, we'll go through them. Sure. All right, I don't even know what movie this is from, but it's interesting, it's abstract. I'm assuming that's why you chose it. Sure, so, so yeah, so, so, so just so everybody knows, there's, I think, two shots that I picked that are in this kind of whole lineup and the rest are, are ones that Paul chose. Um, so I chose this one. Um, if you had to guess, Paul, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to start with you actually, before, <laughs> before I start, what is the feeling of this? Like by the, by the framing, where the camera is, kind of the colors you're seeing, what, what kind of feeling or emotion does it? I'm you? sensing drama and mystery and I'm only saying mystery based on the color, like the green. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like, yeah, this person is bleeding or they're bloody and they're trying to cover it up. So to me, it looks more, right. it, in that sense, it looks more like, yeah, a mystery or drama, drama about to unfold. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is from Dawn of the Dead. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's uh, the remake from 2004. Um, and I picked it for a few reasons. One, just to talk about color a little bit. That, um, and also just, it's a unique viewpoint, right? Like most 99% of, especially Hollywood films, the camera is at close to eye level of the characters, right? Usually. Um, so this is definitely unique. It's in the water looking straight up at the character, which it looks like she probably just plunged her bloody hand in there to wash it maybe because you're seeing these ripples, which are, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, hiding, hiding her face and kind of warping everything. And then we're getting this color, which is, yeah, like a greenish, yellowish color almost, um, which now in the context of a zombie movie, uh, oftentimes in, in movies you see yellow green or that yellow green color or yellow kind of representing disease or uh, illness or something rotten. Um, that look. Right, so, so giving us the idea, okay, it's a zombie movie, people can get infected. She has a cut in her hand. Maybe this is dirty water and she's gonna get infected, right? Um, so that, that's the main reason I picked it was because of the color. Um, color is something that some professional cinematographers focus on more than others. Um, I think it's more and more kind of a dying uh, art, I guess, that cinematographers, a lot of them don't really pay attention in, in in big Hollywood blockbusters, they don't pay attention to color as much. Um, if anything, films are probably getting less colorful. I think it way. depends, but I, I've noticed that uh, international films are more experimental with color, like sure. using different colored gels. I've noticed that quite a bit, actually. Uh, that's interesting. And something, another point to bring up, just, just for, so everyone can kind of get on the same track uh, as us, is, you know, classic Hollywood movies the lighting was to establish the setting or make characters pretty much beautiful. But now lighting has changed to make the scene functional. And now there's a meaning behind the color of a film based on the genre or the character or just the overall mood. It's a lot more expressive. So there's this whole evolution of uh, cinematography and it's really interesting and even just interpreting this film uh, and I, I have seen it actually I just don't remember the shot um, but 
I, I kind of take in the distorted features of the character. Maybe it has to do with change. Uh, and you have a close up of the hand and not the face, right? Usually it would be like the face of the character. Or if it is the hand, it'd be facing down towards the water, not literally in the water. Yeah. 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 So that was, a, that was a good pick. Interesting pick. Do you, uh, quick uh, quit, pop quiz. Do you know who directed this movie? Uh, wasn't it uh, Edgar Wright? No, it was the no. Now you think of Sean of the Dead. <laughs> Same guy who did the. Oh, Spider this is Zack Snyder, right? Didn't he no. do Spider-Man movies? What is it? Who directed Spider-Man? Oh, Sam Raimi. Sam right. Raimi directed these movies. That's he right. did a remake. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. How did I forget that? And fun fact: the cinematographer for this movie also did Dumb and Dumber too. I would have never known that. <laughs> I mean, he did better movies than Dumb and Dumber 2, but that's the only one I'm going to give you. Go look, go look up uh, what else he's done. His name is uh, Matthew F. Uh, Leonetti. Leonetti, I believe. Um, yeah. Anyways, let's move on, yeah? This right. is one Paul picked. Yeah. Paul is obsessed with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, I think. Yeah, I am. Uh, for good reason. For good reason, yeah. yeah. Um, do you know another pop quiz? Do you know who did the cinematography for this movie? That's a trick question because the director did. That's right. Yeah, Paul Thomas no, Anderson did it all. Department, yeah. Right, right. He he refused the credit because uh, he had you know a camera operator. He had a gaffer. He had a I whole. Think one of the reasons why I enjoyed this movie even more to some extent because it was him. A couple of directors have been doing this recently. They, they're mm -hmm. shooting their own films and it's just a unique take on their vision. And, sure. it, and it adds, I guess it adds more appreciation because they just, they learn more, they know more, not just sure. about directing, but cinematography as well. It's really interesting. But, but just, just to be, just to re kind of remove the over romanticized idea of Paul Thomas Anderson shooting his first, you know, doing the cinematography on his first feature length film, or I should say the first feature length film, he's done the cinematography mm -hmm. for, um, take away some of that. Uh, the only reason was because the cinematography he normally uses wasn't available. So he was just kind of like, okay, yeah. we'll, we'll just, <laughs> it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm an artist. <laughs> it was just kind of forced his hand. Yeah. Um, but this one, to be honest, I've seen this movie, I think twice uh -huh. um, and I cannot, remember this part of the movie. So I'm gonna try to interpret the, interpret the meaning, similar to what you just did, Paul. I'm gonna try to interpret it and like get a feeling for it, but I'm, I'm probably gonna be way off. So, but the feeling I get is, cause it's a frame within a frame, right? I drew this little uh, box here. Where is it? There it is. That's a good, that's a good thing to point out. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's frame within a frame and which gives us one of two feelings, I think. Either that these two characters are trapped, right? That's oftentimes what frame within a frame means. You have this frame kind of trapping these characters. You see it in Westerns a lot. Uh, it, in The Searchers, there's a famous shot where the cowboy, John Wayne, is at the door and he's kind of separated, right? Um, so it could be they're trapped. It could also be that we're just in a separate space than them, right? Because in this movie, these two people have a very, very weird relationship that kind of evolves throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give anything away, but it's weird and it's hard to understand why they're in this relationship. So maybe we're separated and the director kind of put us inside while they're outside to give the feeling of these people are in their own little worlds. We don't understand. We're in this room. They're out there. And yeah, it's bright and it's sunny and cheery and there's greenery and there's bright flowers and orange juice and a white tablecloth. So it looks nice. And where we are is kind of dark, dingy. You're, right? you're pretty much on the right track. Yeah, this is, I? Okay. I believe this is the first part, or this is like near the end of the film or, or the second portion of the film. Mm. They're, they're already married. Uh, okay. and we're exploring their relationship okay. for the first time as like they're together. Oh, is, this, is, this, is this like the montage of their honeymoon? 
or okay. something like that? So, yeah. Maybe? Okay. And so I think the curtains here create a theatrical presentation of, mm. it's almost like yeah. an oxymoron. It, he's kind of saying, this is what marriage is like, and it's a beautiful landscape, and everything looks great. But then when you get into the conversation, they disagree with each other and they argue. Sure. Yeah, the, the curtains of a theater makes it like this is just a show. It's not even. Yeah. Like, okay. It's, it's, a, it's a false impression of sure. relationship. Sure. Which it very much is. Um, so yeah, uh, cool. I think I think that was a pretty good interpretation. Uh, I I think a lot of this movie, for the most part, was naturally lit, like the landscapes. So I think that really is sunset. I know it's kind of hard to see. Um, yeah, and, it looks it looks like this. I mean, it's hard to tell because it's a little bit low resolution, but it looks like I'm seeing like some orange kind of coming through the trees here. So yeah, it, yeah. sunset or sunrise, something like that. Adds to that, to that beauty. Okay, let's sure. look at the next image here. All right. Oh, Road to Perdition. Who's road this to, photographer? Here's a, uh, isn't it Road? I think it's Road to Perdition, not... Road to... Yeah, I said it wrong. Right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Am I? I? I can't... No, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, pretty sure it's perdition. Um, yeah. So this is this was done by a cinematographer who's super super famous. His name is Conrad L. Hall. Uh, yeah. He's done he's done Butch Cast and the Sundance Kid. He's done American Beauty. He's done a ton of films. Um, and this was actually I think his last feature film that he did before he passed away. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that until I did some homework on it. Um, full disclosure, I did some homework for you, Paul. Um, but yeah, so this one, uh, I, I actually rewatched this movie fairly recently just for the fun of it. Um, and so in this scene, we know that, uh, I forget the character's name, but Tom Hanks's character is kind of coming back for revenge, right? His, his family was killed. This used to be his mob boss and kind of father figure in his life. And so now he's coming to get revenge because he killed his family. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it. Too bad it came out a long time ago. Um, and uh, so what's interesting is, is obviously it's nighttime, so it's dark. Character's kind of side lit. So you're seeing his face almost split in half, right? You got a dark side and a light side, which to me shows conflict, right? Because although he's a bad man, the dark side, he killed Tom Hanks's family um, and kids and has done terrible things, but there's the light side, like, because he, in the movie, you get the feeling that he actually does care for him yeah. even though he killed his family like he still looks at him as a son his real son is kind of a am i allowed to cuss on here just don't go don't okay go. his real son is a uh, a flub up i'll say flub up um and <laughs> yeah uh so he viewed him as his real son so that's kind of the light side like he he's sorry for what he did he didn't want to do it uh, I don't even think he he ordered it, right? His son just kind of did it on his own, and he, he was forced to defend his yeah, biological what's also son. Yeah, right? interesting about the lighting. Sorry to interrupt. Is yeah. the only light sources are from the street lamps, but what's interesting is the rain helps mm. spread the light. It's called a wet down on set uh, when you have uh, rain, and so aesthetically, it works like emotionally for the scene, like the for drama. Mm -hmm. But it also works to see the background as well, like the, it's right the rain reflecting off, or the light reflecting off the, the rain, right? Yeah, so so it helps with rain. Rain's hard to catch or capture on camera. Um, if you've ever gone outside with a camera and tried to take a photo or a video in the rain, you'll you in real life, you'll usually find that the rain doesn't show up very well. Um, so what you have to do is you have to backlight it whatever direction your camera's facing, you have to have a, a light coming from the opposite direction kind of towards the camera to highlight all the little individual drops of rain. Yeah, a lot of rain. Yeah. That, oh, it's a ton of rain. Yeah, this was an, this was an interior set that they build. Um, oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I'm like an old military base in Chicago or something like that, I think. Huh. Um, uh, mo most of their sets were, were built in there from what I understand. Um, but let me show you here. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. Uh, and I'm going to share. Where is it? One sec. There it is. I found a behind the scenes photo of this specific scene. 
Are you seeing that? It's, it's very oh, low resolution. That, that's really interesting. Super, super low resolution. So, so I hate to do this, Paul, but I'm going to correct you. The, the street lights are not the only light sources, as you can see. Well, I didn't uh, say that. I said they're the only ones we see in the scene, in the shot. I'm oh, sure there are other lights. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is from kind of the same angle that the camera we just saw on. So we have this big light kind of going. It looks like it has, it's, again, it's very low res, so it's hard to tell, but it looks like it has multiple layers of uh, diffusion to soften the light that's hitting, um, what is it, Paul Newman, right? That's hitting Paul Newman. Uh, and then they've got, you see all these black squares, uh, duvetine flags that are kind of blocking the light from spilling all over the place. It helps kind of control it. Uh, you can see people hand, holding one there, there, um, and it's kind of lighting this one spot. And then this is the light up here on the top of the set that's backlighting the rain and making it possible to see the water in the first place. Oh, okay. And then they have random lamps up here kind of lighting the side of the buildings. Um, yeah, you know, I, thought, I, I found that and I thought I would show that. I thought that that was is interesting. Cool. You know what's really neat about Sam Mendes and even Conrad Hall is you've seen a ton of gangster films and it's not your typical shootout. It's actually a very quiet scene. Mm -hmm. There's guns going off and it's mostly silent and the music kicks in and it's a very emotional moment. And I feel like all of Sam Mendes' films are very unconventional toward the genre that he approaches. And same goes for this movie. And I didn't think this would happen in the end. Like I knew the revenge was coming. I didn't know how it was gonna you know, occur. Uh, and they made it, they, they kind of created it in this orchestrated way that was you know, very beautiful. And just sh even showing you, showing us the set here that you threw up on the screen was really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like my favorite scene from the movie too. <laughs> I mean, it's the best looking scene just because yeah, the, yeah. the, the rain is so dramatic in it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, right, let's, let's jump on to the next. Oh. Oh, rule of thirds. You should probably talk about that too. Yeah, rule of thirds. I'm sure you talk to your students about this all the time. Yeah. Um, but usually you want your main subject, well, not you, I, I should say, you don't, so nine times out of 10, when someone grabs a camera and they're, and for the first time and they're brand new at taking photos or video, they tend to put their subject right in the center of the frame, like you see with my face here, right? Uh, which seems natural, right? Oh, I want people to focus on this, I'm gonna put that in the middle, which happens a lot in action scenes, just because they're, editing fast so they keep everything kind of in the middle. Um, but with this, like you said, it's a little bit slower. It's not as conventional of a like gun shootout scene or anything. Um, so you want things to be on a third and you can, um, you can imagine this grid uh, on your frame when you're doing it. Some cameras have it built in mm -hmm. that you can turn on and you want your main subject to be on the intersection of these lines somewhere. One of these four They're compositional influencers. It's where the audience is more likely to look. Right, right. So he is on the top, this top line, right, that right line where it intersects the top right third. Yeah. And he's also and, larger in the frame, which which means he's more important than the subject who's from right, but, but by putting him off to the side instead of directly in the middle it leaves space for Tom Hanks's character in the background. So you can see him kind of it coming provides in. information. For yeah, this. for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's look at the next shot. This is Psycho. This is Psycho. Yeah, um, yeah so this, this, this is a classic. Uh, hopefully everybody's seen this movie. Um, <laughs> but th this shot's always kind of, I think probably sticks in everybody's mind. This is the way that it's framed with, especially with that owl in the background. Um, it it kind of almost distracts you from the scene mm -hmm. a little bit, I think. Um, or I should say it distracts you from the, the character Norman, right? Like he's, he's in the scene, he's talking, he's reacting in the scene, but you can't help but look at this owl. And it's very, very low resolution. But in the movie, it almost looks like the owl is looking straight at the camera or, or straight at Norman. And the owl's in this kind of, um, I don't know, like attack, attack, mode. attack, yeah, or predatory kind of pose, which makes it look dangerous, which I think pretty obviously is meant to kind of symbolize the, the danger inside of his head, right? He's also a predator, yeah. 
Um, you know, also, the lighting. The lighting shadows, like the lights coming from below. Right, right. Yeah, the, the lighting's coming from below. You can see that shadow from the owl up here. And the lighting is also the brightest on the owl, which is also why your eye gets drawn to it, because it's, it's brighter than he is, right? He's kind of, we're on the shadow dark side of him. I mean, both literally and kind of figuratively, right? He's yeah. a dark <laughs> character. And, and yeah, you're right. The, the lighting from below makes everything look more sinister. In real life, whether you're outside in, during the day or in like an office building or a school building, lighting almost always comes from the top, which looks natural and normal. So to make something look unnatural and not normal, abnormal, you shoot it from, uh, you have the, uh, the lighting come from below and it looks very unnatural, which automatically kind of makes it look scary and creepy and unknown, which is why people do that with uh, like Hot campfires. Yeah. They'll do stuff like this, right? <laughs> um, I bumped my mouse, but also follows the rule of thirds and Norman and the owl are both on thirds, right? So they're almost like equals in this shot, which is interesting. <laughs> It's also a low angle, uh, looking up at him. As a character. What was that? The lower the, the a low angle shot. The character has more power in the scene. Right. Yeah. He has. He has kind of. He looks more. Uh, yeah. Scary. He has more power. Um, and uh, yeah. What's interesting about this movie is, I think, if I remember right, the whole thing was shot in fifty millimeters, um, which generally from most people um most people agree that 50 millimeters kind of matches what the human eye views the perspective of the human eye um mm -hmm. compared to like a wider lens or a telephoto lens um and hitchcock and his cinematographer uh john l russell probably chose a 50 millimeter because throughout this movie there's voyeurism everywhere right like the, the famous shower scene he's spying on her through a hole yeah. So by doing 50 millimeter the entire movie, it really kind of makes it, gives it a, almost a documentary feel. Feels like we're kind of really watching this. And it's, I never thought about that actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting. Okay. Good to know. I'm learning a lot already. <laughs> Just in well, this, these last couple images. You that's <laughs> why I'm here, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next shot. Ooh, Gattaca. Gattaca. So you, this is another image that Paul put on here. I haven't seen this movie in such a long time. So I, I tried to. I tried last night. I looked for it and I couldn't find it anywhere, like on any of my streaming services. Anyways, it's streaming on Crackle, I think, right now. Oh, is it? Free, okay. Free streaming yeah. Series. yeah, but then there's commercials. Ugh. Um. Anyways, so uh, again, I'm gonna try to guess, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Uh -huh. From what I remember from the story this character is kind of selling his identity to someone who is genetically less than him. So that person can have a better life or something like that. Right. For the most part. Yeah. Okay. So, so I did some homework. I cheated a little bit. I did some homework and the cinematographer whose name I cannot pronounce. It's um, yeah. What was that? It's Polish, I believe. Yeah, it's, I wrote it down. It's, he worked on Three Colors Blue, which is another film I recommend yeah. you would watch. Yeah, it's, his name is Slawomir Idziak. Yeah, uh -huh. something like that. Yeah, he also did uh, Black Hawk Down. Yeah, uh, he did o Harry Potter Order of the Order of the Phoenix. Um, <laughs> but, anyways, so he in this movie chose kind of three colors to stick to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's another really good example of color, and it just happens to be also green. Uh, but also in the movie is yellow and blue from what I did the homework on. And the, the character's kind of past is represented in uh, yellow, I believe. Right. And then his, his kind of his future or his evolution is into like a new life is blue. And his transition from past to present to his like lesser life to his kind of better life mm -hmm. is done in green. So this is when he, the main character who is not Jude Law, uh, main character meets him and is gonna steal his identity, well not steal, but buy his identity from him. Mm -hmm. And so this scene is, and the montage is green to signify a change. And do you know what two colors make green, Paul? Tell us, Michael. Blue and yellow. <laughs> Crazy, his past and his uh, future combined make his That's evolution. Kind of I didn't... Wow. I'm learning so much. <laughs> it is. It is interesting. Um, 
and yeah, this 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 is a good example of a movie that is way more colorful than a lot of modern movies are Actually, kind of willing to do. Film. Yeah. You don't see too many colorful science fiction films. I know Blade Runner 2049 had a lot of color. Sure, sure. But this yeah. film was, I, I would say, this is like the first film to really experiment with mm -hmm. color and minimalism, uh, with like the architecture and everything. Right. Um, also, the camera angle is slightly above eye level, making this character look kind of, you know, weak or maybe, because I think in the story he's put in this position out of necessity. Uh, I believe because he, he can't work himself so he needs to make money so he sells his identity so he can have money and live or so, something like that I think so and it's also a, a scene where two characters um, are kind of talking about him as if he's not even there they're just like talking down like talking about him right. like oh yeah he's in a wheelchair uh, I'll take his identity I don't know I don't really look like him uh, is like that was in the right film. so it's kind of they're talking about him very rudely uh, as if he's not there. So this downward angle kind of makes him look a little smaller and weak. And they didn't do it crazy where they're like right above him looking down at him. It's just a subtle feeling yeah. that you get. Um, but man, Jude Law has never looked sexier, honestly. It's gotta say. <laughs> Even uh, like the staircase. I always thought the staircase mirrored the funny you the should DNA say strand from the poster, the genetics. Yeah. And he's in a wheelchair, so like, why would he have, you know, a staircase? Yeah, yeah, and so I, I didn't think of that. Yeah, staircase, because the whole movie's about genetics and uh -huh. uh, being able to control it to make better people. I, I looked at the staircase in this specific shot as just a way to draw the eye it to the character. Right? Yeah, all of these steps, the framing uh, of the staircase, kind of draw your eye to this one character. And also, he's got that hot spot on him, which is the brightest part of the image. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Cool. Let's let's look at the next shot. All right. How are we doing on time? We doing okay? No, we're actually a little over time, so oh, no. <laughs> have to rush you a little bit. All right. It's all good. So yeah, this is another shot I chose, Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And I chose this shot because I wanted to to show everyone like practical effects mixing in with live action. Uh, captured footage and so behind Frodo is is a model it's a it's a miniature and it functions with the scene and I was watching the newer Lord of the Rings films and they didn't build these miniatures it, uh, it looks obvious that it's all visual effects hmm. but I like in this movie in particular too is the lighting really matches the live action shots and, and that's why I chose this and I chose it because we need to look at a wide shot a lot of the other shots we chose are like medium close-ups close-ups so this is our wide shot here sure. so I think another question I know I was watching this film again recently and I was thinking like how did they bring this fantasy element into the film and I think a, a lot of it has to do with lighting like the soft okay yeah I mean look to, to me, the because obviously I can't speak much to the model making or special effects or anything like that. Um, but yeah, the, the lighting, yeah, it's very soft. You've got this haziness up here, which is kind of creating a glow and also kind of suggests that this is kind of a hidden city, right? It's in the storyline, it's basically like no one can find it, only the elves know where it is. Um, and the fog kind of adds to that. It's kind of hidden in the fog. Um, but it also diffuses the light, making it very soft, kind of giving it a glow. And it gives a feeling that the elves are kind of these pure, have this pure society, a clean society. They're, they're good. There's no traces of evil. And there's hardly any dark spaces in here. Like even the shadows have detail. Like in real life, in a scene like this, if you had the sun above you and you were shooting and you can see under a bridge or an awning, that would be almost pitch black in real life in, yeah. in a camera's perspective without adding additional lighting. So it gives it kind of this, there is no darkness, there is no evil, there is no, there's nothing hiding. Uh, it's just pure good in this town, in this society. Um, That's good. Kind of cool. That was good. Yeah. And look at this, Paul. I don't, I don't know if this is done on purpose, but 
the golden oh. ratio. The golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequence, yeah. yeah. Draws your eye. Yeah, so, so I might be seeing this and the filmmakers might not have done it on purpose or maybe they did do it on purpose, who knows. Um, but it kind of, yeah, it kind of helps you because the first thing you see is the character, right? They're the closest thing to the camera. Um, it's obviously a human figure and we're drawn, our eyes are drawn to other humans automatically, right, in society. So obviously we're gonna look at Frodo first. And then if you look at the uh, track of this line, it kind of helps you kind of naturally, that's kind of how your eye naturally travels throughout this image, right? You kind of start on him. Oh, you froze. What was that? I heard small. Oh no, did we lose Paul? Paul, are you there? I think his or my internet might've dropped now. It's large, very oh. large. We're seeing the scale. You glitched out. <laughs> You're good now. I don't know if it was you or me because I couldn't, you froze also. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out in the recording. Yeah. <laughs> um, repeat what you said. I missed it. I was saying that the character Frodo is small against this large background. And another thing I think is sure. cool about this film is the scale, the relations with this, the scaling of the characters of different, mm -hmm. uh, like variety of characters, like dwarves, hobbits, um, humans they all have different heights and they all look different in various environments and i think because he's small as well and there's like these large pillars above you your eye does they're drawn to the the largest aspects of the frame sure yeah, yeah. um but what doesn't kind of make sense is he's a hobbit he's shorter a lot shorter than the elves but that railing is like at a normal level. So if an elf was here, that would be like at his knees, which is not safe city planning because then the elf could easily fall off. Just saying. All right. <laughs> so that was important, right? Yeah. Um, so this one is from uh, Darkest Tower. Um, have you seen this film, Paul? No, I haven't. Oh, it's so good. Um, same director as Atonement, which oh, okay. we, we both like a lot. Um, this, I, I like this shot. I mean, this shot is, or sorry, this film is full of kind of beautiful cinematography, I think. Very simple cinematography where there's oftentimes one light source, not a bunch of crazy lights kind of hidden off camera everywhere. Uh, not a lot to it, just one simple light source coming down. Let me get my pointer. Uh, coming down from the ceiling um, and our two main characters are walking towards the light giving us the feeling that either because they're about to make a big decision in this kind of political environment right on whether the war is going to be won if they're going to survive the war or not um, World War II so this walking into the light could mean doom death right walking the light at the end of the tunnel or it could be heaven. It could be they're, they're, they're walking into their salvation. They're walking into something that's going to save them from this beam of light coming down, mm -hmm. uh, spilling onto the background, creating a, a silhouette, right? Kind of creates an iconic look also automatically a silhouette kind of creates a simplistic shape of a character giving them almost a heroic feeling. Um, also, there's hardly any color. This, I mean, this, this movie is a color movie. It's not black and white, but this sh shot almost looks black and white. You can barely tell some warmth on the skin tone and some like goldish color on some of the accents of the, of the building here. Um, but that kind of desaturated look also kind of adds, I think, to the kind of maybe doom or hopelessness of what's going on in the movie. Yeah, definitely. I remember seeing the trailers of like the colors being very desaturated. Mm -hmm. Kind of throws back to a historical film, which it very much is. So yeah, good points there. Yeah. So I'd hate to rush you, but we, we are pretty much like a little over time. But if you wanted to kind of- Let's go real quick. You want to go real quick? I think we only have one more left, right? Oh, look, silhouettes, boom, okay. Uh, this is one Paul picked from Atonement uh, by the cinematographer Seamus McGarvey. 
um, who also worked on Anna Karenina, Nocturnal Animals. We need to talk about Kevin. Highly suggest that movie. Yeah. And Bad Times of the El Royale, which is just a fun movie. Um, and it's also the same director as Darkest Hour, like we talked about. So moving faster now. Um, watch the one in this movie. It's like a five yeah, minute long one. Impressive. <laughs> it's not this shot, but it comes, I think, soon after this. So what do we make of the shot? Right. Yes. Natural lighting. Yeah, nat natural lighting. You've got. Do you? If you had to guess, Paul, is this a sunrise or a sunset? If I had to guess. And why? Like. Feels like a fifty-fifty question, huh? <laughs> it looks like a sunrise. Okay, good. I would agree. And the reason I would assume that, and this is this is good information to know, I think, with a sunrise because there's mist here and fog, that is usually indicative of a sunrise. Not always. But the earth, the grass gets cold, dew is created, and then as the sun rises, it heats up that earth and the grass and the dew, and it creates fog and steam. So that's why you get more atmosphere during sunrise than you usually would at sunset. I thought that was kind of cool to, to share. Um, so yeah, so you've got this horizon, which is crossing right through the character's head, which is one thing that kind of helps us draw our eye to this character. Um, if he was below the horizon, he would blend in a little bit more, but because he's this little kind of blip that pops up above the horizon a little bit, helps draw our eye in a little bit more. Also the soft kind of color that we're getting from everything, it feels, and kind of, he's on the dark side, right? The, the sunlight's behind him. So we're getting kind of the dark end of him. It kind of creates this somber, sad feeling. Obviously I know the movie, he's missing, you know, a woman he's in love with. So I know that but it just creates a very kind of sad, lonely, You got cut out there, there a glitch. <laughs> oh, where, where, where did I get cut off? Uh, <laughs> it was a long glitch. We're the whole thing? The character and the horizon. Yeah, so he's popping out of the horizon to help us kind of view the character, um, draw our eye. But yeah, it's a very sad looking shot, right? He, it's a very wide shot. He's not very big in it, making him feel lonely, alone, isolated. Um, I know from the story, he's missing the woman he's in love with. Um, a lot of empty that, space. Yeah. What was that? There's a lot of empty space. Yeah, a ton of empty space. Uh, we're also on the shaded side of him, like the sun's behind him. So we're only seeing the dark side, which makes it feel more somber and sad. And the colors aren't, even though it's a sunrise, which would normally be very, very colorful, especially with the clouds, they'd be saturated it quite a bit to make it feel a little more somber. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, about this movie is if not watch it for the one -er shot, the one long shot for five minutes and 20 seconds, look it up for that. But if not for that, the sex scene is awesome. Not to sound weird, <laughs> there's no nudity in that scene, but it's probably one of the sexiest scenes I've ever seen in my life. It's awesome, just saying. Yeah, all right. How many times have you seen this movie now? I've, I've, this is probably one of the movies I've seen the most of, for sure. <laughs> and not just that sex scene, Paul, okay? <laughs> I've, I've seen this movie a lot. I love this movie. All right, so these are kind of my last questions I had for you. You know, how has working with me changed your perspective right. in cinematography for better or for worse? It's kind of a selfish question, but kind of interested in your honesty. Um, um, I mean, because I've worked with you on so many different projects, I don't even know how many films we made together. If I had to guess six or seven, if I threw a number out there, mm -hmm. but only probably four or five of them count yeah. um, <laughs> is like, I've never worked with a director that many times on multiple projects. So that's kind of changed the way I work with other people also um, kind of creating a shorthand that we have on set because we worked so much together that we don't have to, overly explain ourselves sometimes we just kind of know what's going on and we can move quicker on set and with that I can take that to other sets and kind of more intentionally create a shorthand with a different director and that creates a shorthand quicker instead of taking you know six or seven movies to get that shorthand like it did with you and me I can do that after one day of filming with a different director um, so that's uh, for better for worse, oh man. I'll have to answer that one. Where do I start? <laughs> um, 
I, I could I could use some better food on set, Paul. Just saying, when you make your films, you I could, agree. You could have some better food there for. Oh, yeah, better food would be great. <laughs> You'll get better food on the feature film. Uh huh. I'll believe it when I see it. Okay. All right, and then the second question I had for you is, what advice would you give students who are wanting to be cinematographers who want to work in this visual medium? Do it. Do it. Um. Uh, Just do. Yeah. Whatever you're thinking. I don't know if you froze or I froze, but we're having some kind of technical glitch issue. Yeah. Are you, oh, are you there? Yeah, you froze. Okay. A couple seconds. Um, so I didn't hear what you said, but um, yeah, just do it. Honestly, like people have excuses all the time on why they don't do things, right? Uh, everybody, I mean, I do it like, oh, I'm not going to do the dishes today because I don't feel like it. Right. Um, but you just got to do it. Um, and, and actually that's one for uh, something that has changed me for the better working with Paul. When I first met Paul, I hadn't done anything creative or filmmaking uh, related um, in a very long time. And he kind of just was like, okay, we're making this film and didn't really give me a choice. <laughs> and, Pushed everybody but, to their limit. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so I think that's a great kind of um, thing to do. Even if you're feeling lazy that day, just do it. Force yourself to go out there. Um, I've been trying to, uh, I'll, photography. Photography, I think, is something that can help you learn cinematography a lot, right? If you can, if you can master still photography, then you're that much closer to mastering, you know, video moving images. Um, that's something that I am trying to improve on for sure. I've never been big on photography, but lately, especially with, uh, um, you know, coronavirus, I've been like going hiking and going camping and taking, practicing landscape shots, uh, practicing your composition, looking up compositions um, and copying people. I think copying people is a big thing that, that can improve your work is find a movie you like, copy it. That's okay. Copy it. Do it. <laughs> we all do it. Obviously, if it's for a, a project that's going to be put out on the festival circuit or, you know, someone's buying it or something, if that's the intention, then obviously put your own unique spin on it. Don't copy it, you know, exactly. Right. Um, I mean, we all saw, saw the, uh, how badly that went for the remake of Psycho um <laughs> copying it like shot for shot yeah. but yeah copy people i think that helps a lot too all right well thank you michael for being a guest for our workshop today and we look forward to hearing more about your endeavors in the future and for those of you watching this video uh, of course it's recorded um, feel free to watch the video again <laughs> but uh yeah if you're interested in taking the rtv classes in the future, if you really like this workshop, be sure to sign up.